Welcome. Today we'll be talking about how you can turbocharge your test management with SpiraTest. So first of all, I want to talk about some of the market changes we're seeing, some things we're hearing from customers and partners uh, before we get into the actual live application. Uh, so the first thing is we've been getting a lot of inquiries, uh, partly because we have customers in industries uh, that are more heavily regulated, uh, like life sciences, defense, insurance, uh, some banking clients, and they're very concerned about several things happening in the market, which is making them reevaluate their current tool chains and tool choices. Firstly, the, Atl the Atlassian suite is moving completely to cloud. And we've got many customers that have Jira server products and Confluence and add-ins and various extensions built around the ecosystem, and they are looking for testing and QA alternatives as part of that migration. Uh, we've also got clients who were using the HP suite that was bought Microfocus ALM suite, and with IE7, well, IE7 I11 finally being phased out, um, that no longer works, and a lot of clients are desperately trying to find alternatives that will run in modern browsers and support agile processes. Um, we're also seeing Microsoft customers that are preparing to make the move from Azure DevOps to GitHub as part of Microsoft's strategy um, and looking for testing and QA add-ons for GitHub or GitLab, in fact, to uh, make that change more seamless and have some of the functionality that they're used to. And we're also seeing customers using a variety of older technologies, uh, like some of the IBM products that are looking to modernize their tool chains, become more agile, uh, maybe embrace scaled agile, and looking for QA products uh, to migrate to. As well as those sort of, say, industry-based uh, market changes, we're also seeing the fact that a lot of customers are trying to align their QA practices and QA processes with Agile. The development teams have gone very Agile, but they haven't yet fully embraced DevOps, or they are moving to DevOps, but they need to embrace continuous testing with both shift left and shift right. And so they're looking for tools that can embrace QA in a Agile shift left and shift right uh, continuous testing environment. And lastly, and probably not so happily, <clears throat> 2023 is looking like it's going to be a, a possible recession. Uh, companies are looking to trim costs and improve efficiency. So we've had a lot of customers and potential customers look, coming to us to look at ways they can reduce their costs, um, looking at ways to embrace tools that are more efficient, uh, potentially can allow them to do more things with one tool. And so Spira Test, because it can do requirements and testing, has defect management. Um, it's got concurrent licensing, uh, available cloud on-premise, and it's got you know, pretty good pricing as well. Um, they're finding they want to move off some of the other more expensive and more, I guess, discrete products into a platform that is more integrated, also lets them tie in all their other tools as well. So we are seeing a lot of these force, forces and factors as we enter the new year, uh, bringing customers to us uh, with lots and lots of uh, urgent, urgent projects and urgent needs. So let's talk about the products. Uh, Spire Test <coughs> is the product we'll be talking about today. We'll be doing a live demo. Before we get into the live demo, there's just some background on the product and how it integrates with our suite. Spire Test is our test management suite, but it is part of a larger uh, platform. The the Inflector suite consists of the Spira platform, which can which has this which is uh, a enterprise project management, program management system for managing your entire life cycle. <coughs> Spire Plan is the entire suite that covers everything from project management, program management, uh, testing, QA, development, DevOps, all of that information. And Walter, you can have something stronger in the morning if you really want, I just saw that. Uh, and um, as well as that product, we can then augment that with code management with Tara Vault. We also have the Rapiece test automation tool, which can test web, desktop, GUI, uh, Salesforce, ServiceNow, uh, Oracle Forms, Microsoft Dynamics, all the major ERP and CRM platforms. We're adding SAP support next year um, on the QA side. And then also tools for doing IT service management and also exploratory testing. So this comprises the Inflector ecosystem. And so today we are going to be focusing on just one corner of that, Spiro Test, which is the um, you know, requirements and test management piece of that. If you want to see a comparison of the different Spira flavors, there's a link in the presentation <coughs> and you can go to our website. Now, also, please bear in mind that um, Spira Test is upgradable to Spira Team or Spira Plan really easily. So if you use Spira Test, your QA team loves it and is super happy. And now you want to bring on the rest of your team or other departments uh, to upgrade to Spira Team or Plan. It's just a new license key. It's the same product, same user interface, just additional features get enabled. So that way it's really easy to upgrade uh, when, when it makes sense to do so. 
And why would you choose Spira Test? Well, there's lots of different reasons. We'll talk about some of those in the next slides. It is, it is an end-to-end -end QA system. Oops. <coughs> With its web-based user interface, its APIs, its, its requirements, test cases, and defect tracking, all fully integrated. You don't have to have separate tools for the different different teams uh, all working together. We've got robust REST APIs, uh, easy to use web interface, completely mobile responsive, um, and all that integrated together into a single package. And it really comes back to our company philosophy. For those of you who've uh, met us in person at some of the events we go to, like Eurostar or Star East or Inflectricon, uh, if you come to us, you know that we're very, very big into the idea of harmony helping teams and customers work together more efficiently and easily without friction. And that you'll see that in the design of the product. We want to make it as easy to use, <coughs> easy to, to deploy, easy to install, uh, and so on. And we do that in three main ways. The first way is because we do what's called across disciplines. The second is through simplicity, and the third is through ecosystems. So first of all, e disciplines. What that means is we're not building a testing tool just for testers. We believe that testing is not the same thing as quality, and we believe that quality should be everywhere in your life cycle. So we want to build functionality for testers, but we also want to build functionality for developers and managers so that SpiraTest helps all three groups improve the quality of your systems and your products across the entire life cycle. Um, so that's a really important part. We don't want it to be just a tool for testers to do testing. It should be a tool to improve quality that might be used by testers, but also used by developers and managers together. The second thing is simplicity. Simplicity doesn't necessarily just mean simple. Simplicity means, sorry, I got a bit of a cough today. Simplicity means having the system work out of the box for you. So you spend more time using the system on the right and less time on the left customizing it. Because a very simple system might require lots of plugins and lots of configuration to actually achieve the objectives you need. So we've designed SpiraTest to be available out of the box, no customization, no configuration needed. You can customize it, you can configure it, but it's not needed to get going. And the other thing is harmony. We know that you're going to be using different products. We know there are other tools out there, ServiceNow, GitHub, GitLab, Microsoft, Atlassian, open source products, Cypress, uh, JUnit, yeah, JMeter, you, you name it, we, you're probably using it. So we want to make sure that those products can integrate seamlessly with SpiraTest and you're not becoming a de facto system integrator. We want you to be a user, not an integrator to use our products. So we're gonna go into the live demo and the features, but for that, just some interesting use cases. So these are some of the customers that we have. Uh, SpiraTest is used across all these different industries from energy, but, uh, finance, insurance, banking, general IT, a lot of interesting government and defense, especially with the on-premise functionality. Uh, same thing with healthcare, biosciences, medical devices, hospital systems, telecommunications, uh, hospitality and transportation as well. And then obviously even in retail and consumer goods. So these are just some of the customers that we have in each industry. And we have a larger customer list on our website. Some of the things that, that are very differentiated in SpiraTest, one is we have end-to-end -end traceability out of the box. From requirements to test cases, the test runs to defects, you'll see it live in the system. Uh, traceability runs from the beginning to the end. We've got data privacy and security built into the tool. All versions of the product, even the Spira test, come with single sign-on, multi-factor authentication, data encrypted at rest, data encrypted in transit, uh, audit tracking. <clears throat> also, if you're using our cloud version, we can have data residency in the EU, in the US, in Canada, in East Asia, in Australia. Depending where you need your data to be, we can host it for you in that region and the data stays in that region. If you want to go on-premise or use private cloud, absolutely fine as well. We can also generate all your test and QA documentation from the system. We include workflows and built-in electronic signatures. So if you, are, if you are working in a regulated or validated environment for like life sciences or insurance or aerospace or automotive, we have all that built in. And the other thing is because we're integrating all these tools for you, you've got the entire uh, supply chain of, of all your and DevOps uh, tool chain integrated for you without you having to do all that work. Here's some of the standards we comply with. Everything from aerospace, the life sciences, uh, risk management, healthcare, automotive, all of that you'll see here. And of course, Spiders has won many awards. Here's some reviews from uh, IT Central Station, which is now, I think it's now called Peer, Peer Hub, uh, Capterra, or Gap, Capterra, which is part of uh, Gartner Digital Markets, and G2 Crowd. So feel free to browse us online and check out some of the reviews. Uh, we always believe you should try our product. With, we have free trials. And of course, you should check out the reviews, see what other people are saying as well. Uh, and of course, integration is key. If you can't use Spiritus with your other tools, it's not going to work for you. So first of all, we have integration with various different IDEs, 
So if you're going to be coding in, in different tools, or you have integration pre-built for Visual Studio, Visual Studio Code, uh, IntelliJ, Clips, uh, all of the other IntelliJ IDEs as well. And because, as I mentioned, Harmony is baked into our philosophy at the company, we have all these other integrations. There's actually over 70 integrations now. This is just a subset. Uh, and we cover everything from IDEs, unit testing frameworks. We, have, we integrate with various different CI and build servers, whether it's Jenkins, whether it's Team City, or now you're moving to GitHub, GitLab Actions, or it could be Circle CI, various different project management tools, including Jira, ADO, GitHub, GitLab, Asana, ClickUp, Monday.com came out last week, um, modeling tools like Enterprise Architect, various different automation tools. If you're using commercial tools like UFT or Test Complete, absolutely fine. Worksoft, Tosca, Banarex. If you go on open source, you know, Cypress, JUnit, NUnit, uh, Mocha, um, PyTest, uh, Ro Robot Framework, all of that's available as well. And CRM, Salesforce ServiceNow, and of course, performance testing with a variety of different tools. Everything from open source JMeter and Octoperf, which is based on JMeter, to more expensive tools like LoadRunner or Neo, NeoLoad. And you'll notice there that we actually integrate with a lot of our competitors. So it is an open platform. If you are using Tricentis tools or SmartPair tools, we integrate with almost all of those as well. We don't want it to be a false choice. Spiritus is your QA hub. You want you to be able to choose the tools that work best for you, even if they are from a competitor. That's completely fine. So with that, let's uh, get rid of the PowerPoint and move on to the live application. And with that, I'm going to open up my browser over here. Get rid of Zoom. And um, before I, this is Spyro Test right here. And to prove there's no, no trickery, this is actually a trial I signed up for about 10 minutes before the demo. So this is literally an out-of-the-box installation of Spyro Test. I've done nothing to it other than sign up for the trial and log in. So everything you see here today is out-of-the-box and pre-configured. So let's see. So when you first log into Spyro Test, let's get you in the system. We have in the navigation two main things. We have what we call products. These you can think of as projects. Um, and then we have what are called programs. If you're coming from the HPE world, the ALM world, these are projects, these are domains. In the Jira world, these are projects. In the Azure DevOps world, I think these are projects. And I don't know what they call these um, accounts, maybe. But the idea is every system being tested will be a product. All the releases and sprints and phases will be in the product. You don't need to create separate products. You will then have programs. That's a collection of uh, products that may be a single business unit. And you can then report on them both individually as a product or as a program. So if I wanted to look at a product, I can go to the dashboard. That's the hexagon you see in the top left. And this will show me a general uh, project manager's view, product owner's view, scrum master's view of the project. This is the dashboard. Here's my open issues. Here's my, my two active releases right now. You can see my requirements, what percentage of my requirements have been developed and tested. You can see my schedule. I'm overdue on one release and I'm behind on the other, but not yet overdue. So I can still correct that. You can see my uh, completion. You can see things like defects and requirements. Requirements test coverage is right here as well. Incident open counts. So you can see right here a holistic view of the project from requirements. How many requirements do I have? Can we test them? Have we tested them? How many of them are covered or not covered? You can see various important graphs like burn down, burn up velocity, all of that's right here. And we can see which of my features has the most defects. So from a quality standpoint and a project management standpoint, it's giving you a lot of good information all in one place, including the milestones. If you want a more focused view for the testing for the test manager or the QA manager, click on the testing tab here. And now we're going to drill down into much more testing information where you will see some of the same graphs like requirements coverage. But you'll now see test progress, cumulative test counts over time, test status, and so on. And all these metrics are being shown for this one product. Uh, defect counts, defect open counts, and so on. But if I want to see just a specific release, that's easy. I can filter it by one release or a different release, and that will show that release only and the sprints within that release. So now I can see just the test progress for that one release. You can see I'm getting I'm getting passes, but I've kind of flat, flat, uh, flatlined here, plateaued. Now I'm getting some failures coming in, so that's not so good. So you can see your progress. Gray is not run. So what you really want to see is the gray bar getting smaller as we run more and can cover, do more testing. As we do more testing, we'll see more passes, but we will see more fails. So that's relatively a natural graph we would see in the early part of a project. And you can see by phase, I've got my three sprints. This is fully, fully tested. This one is partially tested. There's some failures, minor failures because they're marked as caution and a few blocks. Here we've got a bunch of failures. So you can see you've got different sprints running at different times in parallel with the results all kept. And then the release view will show you the aggregate of that sprint. 
Same thing with the other metrics. We're now seeing it at a release level. You can also drill down to a sprint level, or if you want to go up one level, you can go up to the program view, and now you're going to see the program-wide dashboard. And again, this has a general dev view, which is more project management centric, or we've got a testing view, more QA centric, and that's going to show you some of the same metrics, but now it's not just for one project, it's for all the projects in that program. So it gives you a, a view of all the projects in the program side by side and in aggregate. Oh, and I should mention, if you have any questions, please write them in the Q&A. I will get to those towards the end. Okay, moving on to the um, meat of the system, as it were. Uh, when you go into the project, we'll back, we're now back at the dashboard, but I'll just unset that. The way the system is organized is we have three main areas for Spira Test. We have the planning, the testing, and the tracking. Those of you who have eagle eyes will notice that you have padlocks and other sections. So you might wonder what's developing, what's planning board, what's risks. If you see the item grayed out with a padlock, that means the feature is available in a different version of Spira. So I'm using Spira test. That's today's focus. It's a tool for planning requirements, testing, and tracking defects. It's a QA, QA toolkit. Let's say you're using the tool, QA team loves it, and they're like, well, I want this planning board. I want to do agile you know, scrum planning. I want to do source code tracking. I want to link that to my requirements. I want to do risk management. Very important things to do. Want to do risk-based testing? No problem. You can upgrade to Spira Team or Spira Plan, and that unlocks those features. But that's why you're seeing that. So let's start at the beginning. <clears throat> requirements. Requirements in Spira Test are organized in a tree structure. We've got the parent-child relationships available. You can see that there are different types of requirement. These are uh, the different types we have, fully customizable. You can change the types. Um, this is based on a, on a sort of scaled agile model where you have epic feature and user story. If this is a scrum project, you might just have backlog items or maybe of epics and backlog items, nothing else. If it's a more traditional V model, you might have feature, you know, functional requirements, system requirements. All of these things you're going to see, they are customizable. If you go to the three hexagons in the top right, you, of course, can customize these. Uh, I'm not gonna spend too much time on that today's demo. This is just a sort of a, a quick look at the system. But if you were to go in there, you can customize that and have different workflows too. So everything you see can be customized. This is literally just the out of the box version we're using. All the requirements are listed here. You can get tooltips by hovering over them. If you see this column mark test coverage, that's related to the graph on the left. That's gonna show you how many of the uh, tests in that particular requirement have passed or failed. If I control click on it, bring up a requirement, and we do have tabbed editing, of course, in Spira. Um, you can see this is the one requirement. It's a completed requirement, but if you go to test coverage, you'll notice it's got three test cases. Two have passed, one has failed. We could drill down and see why it's failed, check the test run. But if you go back to the, the summary view, you'll see that's why it's got this color of two green and one red. That requirement, that feature, it's been tested, but it's got one failure and two passes, and those results will aggregate up the hierarchy to the top level you'll see the combined test coverage of the whole uh, requirements tree you can of course filter this let me find any requirement that's not covered these are all my requirements that are missing test cases or i can find any requirement that's got failures very easy to do that in general throughout the system whether you're in the requirements view test case view you can show and hide different columns you can export to different uh, different um file formats, you can print things out, you can copy items to other products, you can create test cases from requirements in one click, you can create a regression test set from requirements. There's lots of quick options in the tools menu. There's also right click context menu. And you can also indent, outdate, refresh, delete, insert and do all that stuff. So this toolbar lets you activate all the main features. You can also share your filters. So I can go in here and save a filter. If I save a filter, I can select the columns as well. So if I've shown them high different columns or I've dragged them, made them different widths, all of that gets remembered and saved into a shared view. And then you can click on this link here and that will activate the shared view. So now I'm filtering by critical requirements that are not covered by tests. That becomes favorites that you can either have for you or for the team. Going into requirements, just to finish up this section, if you look at the test coverage, that's where you can see the testing of that requirement. Go to overview. That's where you'll see the core requirement information, including the release it's scheduled for, any custom fields, standard fields, dates, the description of the requirements right here. We've got a built-in rich text editor where you can paste images in. And of course, we've got comment tracking as well. You can see any attachments linked to, to that requirement. We've got four different things linked to it, some, to a Word doc, uh, Illustrator file. I think it's a Photoshop mockup. All those attachments you can add 
easily like that. Or you can paste the image right in. In addition to being attached to this requirement, it will also get uploaded into the document repository. The document repository lets you version control all your documents and acts as a QMS. So if you want to publish like a test plan or a test report, you can archive those documents right here in the system. Anything you upload will automatically get put in here. You can organize it by folder and you can also version track it. So if I wanted to have different documents or attachments, I can version track them. And the nice thing with that is if I version track these documents, I can associate this one document with multiple requirements, multiple test cases. So if I have to update a document or a diagram, I don't have to go hunt for every single test case or every single requirement. I can do it in one place and updates everywhere globally. And lastly, as I said, we, we do have customers that are moving away from tools like Atlassian and Conf Confluence. So if you want to do things like create documents live in the system, we can do that as well. You can write, you can write wiki pages using Markdown. You can write rich text content like team standards or SOPs. You can do you can uh, actually create spreadsheets and natively edit them in the system. And we've also got a diagram editor. So if you are going to do flow charts or any kind of or maybe a diagram uh, information architecture diagram of your website, whatever it is, you can do all that directly here in the system using the built in diagram editor. Okay, before we go into the next section, which is testing, I'm going to pop stop for a second just to answer some questions so we don't lose people. <clears throat> the next thing we'll be going into will be the testing section. We've gone through requirements. Uh, oh, actually, one thing, just to finish up requirements, I forgot. There is history tracking and audit trail. Every change you make to a, to a requirement or test will be linked, will be tracked here. And in the associations tab, you can see the traceability from this one requirement to all of the defects that have come out of any of the tests. And you can see the link from this requirement to other requirements elsewhere in the tree. Now, there are some, some Q&A. Let's go have a look. We have two questions, Adam. Yep. First one, is it possible to integrate Git EA? I must admit I'm not as familiar with Git EA. We can integrate Git, yes. And we can integrate Enterprise Architect EA. I'm not sure what Git EA is. I can check it up afterwards. And David um, logged a question. The features are great, but our small, smaller quality team won't be able to make product managers ditch Jira. Well, that's great. And in fact, Spira test is often used with Jira. So in fact, we integrate with Jira in real time. So what you can do is you can go to our um, integrations and you simply connect your product to Jira. And we have a plugin uh, for Jira, which will bring in the user stories. Uh, not that one, sorry. Let me come down a bit. <laughs> Hold on one second. Yeah, we have a plugin with a Jira Cloud, Jira Server, and Jira, Jira Data Center. And you can synchronize the items. What that will do is it will bring into SpiroTest into the requirements section. It brings in all the user stories, features, and epics from Jira. And when, when we run the test case and, and, and execute the test and log the defects, which we'll do in this demo, it will push them over to Jira as well. And then you can update them in Jira. So your developments can, developers can work in Jira and your QA team can work in SpiroTest together. And in general, clients that are using Jira will use Spira test, whereas clients who are moving away from something like Jira, if they are doing that, they're more likely to use Spira team or Spira plan, because that does have more robust product management capabilities than just Spira test. So hopefully that answers the question. We have one more question in the chat, um, and it says, will you have GitHub action support? Uh, we do have GitHub action support. So we have a plugin uh, for GitHub Actions already. If you go into the handy uh, administration menu and you scroll down to Spira Apps, that's, these are all of the extensions that are available inside of Spira. We've got what's called a, a plugin architecture, and we, these are available in the app. We're adding these into different versions. And one of them is actually GitHub, and that lets you launch GitHub Actions uh, directly. You could launch them from Spira if you activate it. You can also have when GitHub Actions run, either launched by Spira or just automatically launched. They will automatically report back into Spira, trigger builds, and trigger test automation. So we do have that already, actually, and GitLab and CircleCI. Uh, um, requirements approval. Okay, let me do that. So someone asked... Do you have requirements approval or can you show it? Absolutely. So thank you for doing that before we get into the testing side. So let's go ahead and create a new requirement like that. So let's go over here. 
we'll call this um, um, as a, uh, I'll do it in, in a user story style. As a user, I want to be able to log into the system. As a feature, I guess it's user story. We'll say change the type. Uh, at this point, it's got nothing else is set, so I hit save. Now, because of the workflow, as you move it through a different um, different stages, it's going to email different people, and it's going to change which fields are required. Now, to simplify this, and because we don't have a lot of time, I'm not going to log in and log out as different users. I'm going to do all of it as my user. That isn't realistic, so just bear that in mind. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, I want to have someone review the requirement. When I do that, it's going to make certain fields required. And in this case, uh, I want to assign it to uh, myself so I can do the next stage. In real life, you might do someone else. And I might even add a comment saying, please review. When you do that, it's going to do two things. It's going to obviously change the status. It's also going to email uh, the user, which is the system administrator, which is me. And it's going to add the comment, obviously. And then I get the email. And if I go to either my email or if I go to my, my page, which is the home page of the application, I will see under my assigned requirements, I will see the uh, item listed here to be reviewed. So that way, I know it's something I have to work on. So then whether I click on that link or I just click on the email, whichever is easiest, I can then review it and I can either reject it and it becomes grayed out and I can say reject. Then it'll go back to the person who wrote it or I could actually approve it. And when I do that, I hand save it. It's going to warn me, oh, to approve it, you actually have to give it a priority. Oh, OK. So let me say it's uh, high. And that's because in the workflow, we specify that you had to give a priority when you move the status. And then after that, it goes to the next step, which would be to plan it. And that's to assign a release. Now the release becomes required, I'll assign the release. And that's all configurable in the workflow. That's a very simple approval. And that was all controlled by this workflow. And this is just the out of the box one. If you wanted to make other fields required, let's say when you request something and you want it to become accepted, uh, when you do that, you could decide which users can make that approval right here. And when you get to the destination status, you can specify which fields become required, which are hidden, which become read only. So as the requirement progresses to its life cycle, some things will become required, some things will get read only. You can get data from the user and then lock it down so it can't be changed after it's accepted. So it really is up to you. Some customers have very simple workflows, other ones have quite complex ones. Also to mention is if you go back to the action, this is where you would also enable electronic signature. If you do need a signature when you approve something, that's where you would enable it right here. Make it yes and sit save, hit save. Follow-up question on that, I think you partially answered. Um, Adam was, can you have more than one approval? Um, so. Um, you can. Currently, you, you, you can do it in a linear fashion. So I can approve it and someone else can approve it. Uh, we, if you want to have parallel, if you want to have parallel, parallel approvals, so I can't speak this morning, uh, then you would need to use Spira team or Spira plan because that has task management. And if you want to have multiple approvals, we do that through the task management system. So you create multiple approval tasks, which can be in parallel. And so for that, you would need to have Spira team. With Spira test, you can do multiple approvals, but they have to be in a strict sequence. So that's one of the differences between the products. If there's no other questions, I'm going to move on just in the interest of time. Let's go into testing. This is a Spira test. I'm going to close some tabs off. <clears throat> so in the testing module, there's basically two main areas, which is test case and test sets. Test cases are the tests themselves that you run. They can be organized into folders and subfolders like that. So here I've got my common tests, functional tests, regression tests. I can expand them if there is anything. There we go. And you can then click between them to get between different folders. If you want to move things around, it's really easy. You can just drag a test case and stick it in a different folder. Very easy. And the folders can create new ones. Hit the Add button. Very, again, easy to do that. That's where you create the folders and the structure. It's really up to you whether you want to do it by test name, test type. This could be the sprints, could be the, the functional areas. There's different ways of organizing it. It's really up to you. Each test case will be displayed with a name, the status, who, who it was assigned to, when it was last run. And you, like we saw with requirements, you can show and hide different fields. You can also filter this by the release. If I want to look at just the test cases that are in uh, release one or the test cases that were run in release two or release three or your specific sprints, you can change that using the release selector and it will just change which test cases are displayed. <coughs> it will also change uh, the results that you see.
Okay, so let's go look at an individual test case. Uh, let's look at this one here, creating a new book. Inside a spiral test, when you create a test case, it's going to have a name. It's going to have the description, which is rich text. That's where you can put things like the preconditions or the post conditions, or you could add a custom text field to have those be separately stored. That's really up to you. You have different attributes. These are some of the attributes here. Uh, URL and these this test type, these are both custom fields. This is the main test case type. That's a standard field. There's also a workflow, so you can also approve test cases, just like we saw with requirements. Like we, like on like on the requirements section, you can email some, this to someone. You can subscribe to it so if it gets changed. You can create new ones. You can clone. These are sort of common features throughout Spira. But there is one special thing on test cases, the suspect flag. If you were to write this test case, move through the workflow so it's approved like this one, and someone goes into a requirement and changes one of the two requirements, that's going to automatically impact this test case and mark it as suspect. This will become yes. And that means that this test case could be impacted by a requirements change. And so you need to verify the impact. And what you can do is go back to your test case list page. And you can then use the show and hide columns feature, show the suspect flag, and then run a filter to see is anything in the system suspect. And in fact, probably nothing is because it's a brand new trial. So that way you can filter those. So that way you can definitely make sure you don't miss any any suspect test cases. Uh, this way, and and once once you review the test case, you then mark it as no, and that will be tracked in the history as well. So that's the test case top part. Now, under the test case top part, we have two sections. For manual testing, you will fill out the test steps. These can will be right here. Each test step consists of the description of what the tester should do, the expected result of what they should see. You can edit it in line. If you want to put a screenshot in, it's really easy. I can go in here and just I'll just paste in my current screen like that. Print screen, paste, save. Really quick to do. <laughs> when you run the test case, it's just as easy to put the screenshots in as well. And the first step looks a bit different. That's because it's a test link. This is we're actually linking in another step. So if I've got some reusable bits of tests, like for example, I don't want to log in every single test case. I want to go click login and to log in and to password. I don't want to do that every single test case. What I can do is I can use the insert link feature and I can basically pick a test folder, grab those test cases like my login script, include that put in the parameter values and then when I do that it's going to do what this created here it includes those, that test case as a child test case and all of its steps are included so if you have common elements like logging in logging out navigation just things that are reusable and used in many places you make them their own test case and you include them that means if you change the, that part of the test you haven't got to go through every single test case and make changes and cut and paste instead you can simply change it in one place and everything will ref reflect that change if you do some of our migration tools, for example, we have migration tools from HPLM, for Jira, from other tools, any of the migration tools, they will bring over the appropriate links and equivalent um, uh, components from those tools as well, particularly HPLM, Microsoft Test Manager. Um, if you scroll down a bit further, if you go down to the automation section, uh, here you'll see the automated test section. If you are using our automation tool, Rapease, that will automatically save its test cases right here into the Spira test test case, which, uses, which means it will be version controlled by Spira and it can be launched and scheduled from Spira. If you're using a third party tool like Test Complete or UFT or Selenium or Cypress, um, then you can still link it in here and, and Spira test can then launch that test and get the results back, but it won't be physically stored in Spira typically. It will be usually stored in like a Git repository that we then link to Spira. Um, when you run the test case, which we'll do shortly, it does create a test run. That test run will be displayed here, and we can have both manual and automated test runs. Automated runs could be things like unit tests, running your JUnit or um, Cypress or NUnit or Mocha or any, any of those other tools that we support, PyTest. And if you want to see which tools were used, you can always show that as an extra column, the runner name. And here you can see we've got a mixture of different automation tools, JUnit, NUnit, Selenium, TestNG. And we've got the manual runs right here. So we give all of this in a single view for this one test case. When the test cases fail and they log defects, which unfortunately does happen, the defects are visible right here in the instance tab. You can also see uh, any attachments to the test case or its steps. There's my screenshot I put in. And you can see which test sets or test suites this test case is being used in. And then lastly, there is a history track tracking. So if I change a step or change anything in the system, it will be tracked here for me. I'm going to be moving on to the test sets section next. Let's see if any any questions on the so far. 
um, C and E. So let's go ahead. <coughs> now, test sets are where you can combine test cases together into groups for execution. It's really useful for test planning and test tracking. However, if you do have a very small testing team, it's a small project, it is an optional part of the system. So you might decide you just want to create test cases in the test case section, and you can assign them out individually and not use the test sets. And for a small team, that can be perfectly fine and very easy. But on the other hand, if you imagine you've got thousands of test cases here and you've got you know hundreds of testers, to assign these test cases that one by one would get very laborious and it's hard to track the completion, in which case you're going to create a test set group the test together and then you can assign the whole set to someone and then you can track that progress much more easily also for a user <coughs> you're not getting a thousand emails saying assign this test assign that test you get one email that says you've been assigned this test set please can you run it so that's the difference let's go into one of the test sets we've already built well actually no let's create a new one so i'm going to create a new test set so let's call it my uh, regression set or release one I want to specify it's for release one right here. Hit save. Once I create my regression set, I go into it. I can now pick and choose different test cases to put into the set. Let's go to test cases tab. Go to add. Choose the folder. Uh, functional tests. Let's grab some of my functional tests. Uh, maybe grab some scenario tests as well. Okay, and then this is the set. This is the order we played in. Now I've got to create the author before I create a book. That's the natural flow because I'm going to use that author in the book. So let's go ahead and drag that up. So this shows that you can easily reassign the order of the tests. And then to assign this to a tester, it's really easy. I just go in here and say, owner, I'll make it again, my user to avoid logging out, hit save, add a comment. Uh, please, can you test this? That will send the email. And I also want to tell this tester when I want them to do it by. Uh, how about end of day today? And we do store everything in, in universal time. So even though I'm doing this in Eastern US time, the reality is that it will obviously um, store that in a universal time zone. So if I have someone in a different time zone, when I save this and they view it, it's going to display that in their local time. So it handles that properly. Hit save. It sends an email to me, uh, Adam, or sister admin in this case, and I will get an email. And if I don't get the email, because I'm not in my email very often, I can go back to my My Page view and I'll see it in the My Assigned Test Sets, hopefully, right here. I hit the play button and now I can do my testing. Now that test set is for manual, te manual testing. I could use a test set for automated testing as well. To do that, I just specify the automation host and schedule it to run on a machine. I can quickly mention that after we do this. But let's let's, let's run a test, that's, that's important. So here we go, I'm gonna run a test. Because the, I already assigned this test set to a release, it's chosen for me. If on the other hand, I wanted to um, let the tester decide that, I could have left that blank in the test set and the tester would choose it. Similarly, the operating system, Windows 10, and Firefox, I'm choosing that as my tester because I know what I'm running on. But if the test manager had said, I want me to use a certain web browser, I could have set that in the test set before I assigned it, and then it would have been preset for me. So you can decide whether you want the tester to do something or you want the test manager to control that. Okay, let's go on. Oh, someone's talking. If someone, someone can go on mute, please. Is someone talking? Um, Okay. All right. Perfect. Um, so if you go into the uh, this drop down, you'll see there's a build drop down. Um, that's really important because if you want to track which build of that release is being tested, then basically uh, that's coming from either Jenkins, uh, GitHub Actions, yeah, Git Lab workflows, um, builds in uh, Azure DevOps or Team City. So any of the CI tools that are on that list I showed you earlier, when they run, they will auto-populate the build list for each release and each sprint. So that, well, that's where this disk data comes from. If you're not using a pipeline or CI tool, you can turn off that field if it's not going to be helpful. OK, let's go ahead and run the test. Now, I don't need help. I've done this before. There are, there are helpful hints throughout SpiroTest, of course. And I'm just going to run a few steps here. So let's pretend this first step uh, Past, I open up the browser, go to this URL. Well, let's go ahead and do that. We actually do have the real application, it exists. Look at that. And we'll pass that. We'll log in with administrator and please change. Does that work? Let's see. And I can put in screenshots. Oh, it works nice. Pass. 
uh, go to the click on the link to create the author, uh, author management, create author, passed. Now, it, this application does actually work, but let's pretend it didn't work. Let's pretend I got to this page, and instead of getting here, I went to an error page or a 404. Let's do that. Oh, my goodness, it's missing, that, which didn't really happen, but we'll pretend it did. That's more exciting. So let's say, oh, oh, failed with a missing page. Notice there is a spell checker, which is good on a Friday. Paste that image in, left align it. Uh, I want to log a defect though, because it is an error, as well as the failure. Going to de-incidence. Now it will warn me, are there any existing defects logged? Now the answer is no, but if someone was running this test and they already logged this defect, I would see it here. And that way it prevents me logging duplicates. So, uh, you know, bug on the uh, author creation page, choose the types. Ah, go away, it's my password manager. Don't need that. Um, the type, you can, these types are all customizable. The priorities are all customizable. If you are integrating with Jira, they should be synchronized with the ones in Jira. So when we file it in Jira, it will automatically line up properly. These are custom fields. Uh, so let's just put these in. And let me go ahead and hit fail. And that's failed the step and log the defect. Now in real life, I would keep going, uh, but I'm not need to do that. But one thing to show is that when I go to the next test case, I, I need to log in and create a book and link it to the author. Well, I can't do that because the, I didn't create the author, so I could mark that as blocked. So that's where a block might come in and say, blocked by previous failure right here. And in real life, again, I would keep going. I'm just gonna pause and, come, and I can show you how you could come back. Notice that there are two other test views. There's the table view, exactly the same information, but in a table format. Some people like this more because you can see all the tests written out step by step and you can scroll through them. Other people like the split view more because you can navigate. Left And the left-hand side is navigation. Right-hand side is the test. Really up to you. Mini view is what you'll see on a, on a cell phone or a tablet because it reduces down the display and it's responsive. Uh, the whole app is actually responsive on a tablet or cell phone. If you ever come by one of our booths in a, in a, in a, in a, in a conference, we actually run Spiritus on a tablet with a, with a stylus and it's really neat. Uh, and of course, the other benefit of the mini view is you might want to run the application you're testing in an iframe. So if I go back here, I could actually take this URL, put it in here. And that way, if I've already got a single physical monitor, I can do my testing over here, put my results in over here, saves having to alt tab. It's really up to you. Uh, I'm done with my testing, so I hit pause. When I do that, if I if I had done all the tests, it would give me a finish button. If I want to resume where I left off because I had to go to the, to the restroom or I had to go to a meeting, I could always resume that, not by hitting this button here, but by going down to the My Pending Runs and hitting the Resume button. If, on the other hand, I'm going to be out all day, I could also reassign to another tester as well who can carry on where I left off. So there is that option. So I did run that test case. If I go back to my test sets section, you will see there's a new run for my test case. So here's my test set, it's still in progress. You can see I've got one failure, one blocked and three not run. If you go down, you'll see exactly how that looks. If I click on the failed link, I will now see the failed run I just created where you will see the step-by-step -step passes and the, the image I embedded and the link to the defect. So let's look at the defect. If I go to view incidents, that will show me the defect. If I click on it, <coughs> I'm now drilling down to the defect that was logged that defect is pre-filled with the name, which I entered, and the description is pre-filled with the description of the step that failed, the expected result, the actual result, and the step-by-step -step breakdown of how far I got. Also, if I go to the associations tab, there's a hyperlink back to the test run, which I was on a minute ago, but also a link back to the source requirements. So if there's a disagreement between, well, actually, it's meant to work this way. No, it's not. Yes, it is. That's all going to be documented right here in the requirements, and that way it's all at your fingertips. The same thing is by going to having that test run available, if someone is not sure what, like what login did you use, it, it doesn't fail when I try and fix it, um, you can see exactly what URL they use, what login they use, uh, if we would gotten further, what test data they used. So that way, developers and testers can work together to harmoniously figure out, well, what was the reason why it failed? Did the test actually follow the same steps? Or is the requirement incorrect? Maybe there's a feature error. Someone miswrote the user story, and therefore it's unclear how it's meant to work. But that's much easier because you have all this information in one place. If you are integrating it with Jira, there will be a Jira ID populated here, and there will also be a hyperlink in the attachment section to, to the item in Jira as well. Before I go any further, there are some questions. Let me look at those. There are three questions, yes. Okay. 
Uh, apologies if it was mentioned already. Is it possible to assign test cases, test sets to a team? Uh, no, not currently. Currently, you assign a test set to an individual, but there, are, but there is, but there is something like it. So I'll come back to it in a second. And demo and Sparrow capture. Yes, I can demo that. I think I'll have time. And the third one in the chat. Can you see more than one step at a time in the scrolling view? Yes. If you um, when I did the um, the table view, that's when you can see more once more than one step at a time. Uh, and, and when you pause it, it doesn't say this pause. Uh, you can just resume it. Uh, it's just it just it, it, pausing. It just means you're not you, you're leaving the test set. You can always come back. Uh, so it's not so it's not actually a status at that point. If you go back to the test result, the question someone logged was, uh, can you see more than one step together? If I resume that one, if I go into table view, that's where you can see more than one step in a scrolling view. So that's the multi-step scrolling view. Every step is listed. You can pass and fail them. If I scroll down, you can pass that step, pass that step. So you can do exactly what I did on the other view. And if I want to fail it, you give an actual result you know, failed. So you can still do everything, but it lets you do it in a, in a scrolling view rather than a clicking view. So you can see every step. So I think that answers that question. Now, the question, the other question was, how do you assign a test set to a team? So it's not exactly a team. What you do is if I wanted different people to run different parts of my set, I can do that. So if I go back to my regression set, <laughs> I had assigned the whole set to, to a system admin. That's a really useful use case when I want one person to run the whole thing. If I want different people to run it, what I will do is I can go in here and I can basically go in and assign the different test cases in the set to different people. So that way, if it's a scenario test where perhaps Amy does the first part, Bernard does the second part, Henry does the third part, and so on, you can do that. And that way, it's now assigned to different people in the set. Uh, if you wanted to have the test sets available for different people to run, uh, there isn't, as I said, there isn't currently a team concept for that. You can just leave the test set unassigned. People can then just run the test set. Um, now we are, we do we have added Inspira Plan the ability to have teams. So that's that's been released in the last version, and currently that's being used in our planning boards, our agile boards. Um, we are eventually going to be adding that support where you could assign something to a team which contains users. That's not yet available. Um, but that will be that is something in the future because we, we have added teams, but we haven't yet added the ability to link that to these to test sets. Uh, and then Sparrow Capture will hopefully get to if we have time. Okay, so uh, we, we did run the test set. We, sorry, we go away. We um, also logged the defect. So just to go into defect view, all the defects are here. I can search and sort by different fields. I can show in our different columns. There is a full, full bug tracking system. So if you are using Spyro to do your defect tracking, um, you can do it all natively, or you can use a third party tool like Jira or DevOps or GitHub or Asana or Monday.com or anything else like that. Um, if you do it natively, you can do the assignments here. There is a workflow engine. So I can assign that to someone to fix when I have, try and save it. In the workflow, you can make fields required. So right now it's going to require me to assign it to a person. I'll assign it to Fred. Uh, I want Fred to start working on it on Monday because I'm nice and I, I think it'll take five hours, but maybe he will find a different value and he can update that so we can track effort as well. Uh, please fix on Monday, Fred. Hit save. That was send an email to Fred. Fred will see it in his my page and Fred can then fix it and I can then retest it. When he's fixed it, I get an email back. And I get notified to do the retest. So you can manage the full life cycle of the defect uh, right here. Um, okay, before we go into reporting, just to quickly mention automation, I kind of skimmed through that. In the test sets view, I did assign that to a person because it was a manual test. For automated tests, <clears throat> works the same way, except instead of assigning it to a person, you would leave that blank and you assign it to a machine. Machines are just logical names. The machine will then have our automation tool. It's called remote, uh, sorry, either our automation tool, which is called Rapiz, or it will have another automation tool. And in which case we have an integration product called Remote Launch. So if you go to our website and you go to the add-ons and downloads, you will see a product called Remote Launch. That's used to connect other automation tools uh, to SpiraTest. So if you wanted to use, say, Tosca or UFT or any of these tools you see here, Eggplant, with SpiraTest, you install this agent on those machines. It listens for Spira's schedule. And then when Spira schedules it, it will then run those tests. And to do that, you would set the machine and then you set the date and time for an unattended execution. You can set a recurrence. I want to run it every day, every hour. Or you can say, 
I want it to only run whenever my Jenkins or my GitLab or GitHub build passes. If you want to do that, leave the date unset, just leave it blank and choose the schedule on build option. And the system will automatically schedule this test to run whenever there is a successful uh, pipeline event, meaning the build passed and it will then schedule to run after that. The benefit is if the build fails, we don't waste time running tests that are not going to be work. So that's some of the automation stuff. And then the automation host that you see, those are all managed in the automation host section. <coughs> you can add and track hosts. You can have different custom properties to um, assign to them, to categorize them. And the last thing we can do in Spyro, which is useful, is you want to, you can manage test data. So if I wanted to run that test set through multiple different iterations of data with different parameter values, I can do that. I can define the parameter values in Spyro. I can combine them using the test configuration feature, and it will build out a data set like this. There are about 12 different entries here. So if I wanted to run a test set through all 12 entries, I can go back to my test set which I was on, I can then assign that test set to the configuration, or I guess the configuration to the test set by using this drop down. And when I do that and I hit save, instead of running uh, four different tests, it's going to run four times 12. We'll get 48 different test results. These four tests run eight different, uh, 12 different times for each of the test parameter combinations. And that's all available directly in Spyro test. And when, of course, all that runs, that's going to create lots and lots of data and to, we want to be able to analyze that data and to do that we'll we use the reporting center that's where all the analytics are you can see graphs and charts we can see the defects logged over time the open counter defects test results we can see the current testing activity you can see the cumulative progress rate as well as the current progress rate you can filter that by different types of test cases by date range you can filter the whole dashboard by release you can also pick and choose any of the other graphs. We have some built-in graphs like the summary graph. I can grab any standard or custom field, grab it against any other field, and it will graph it for me. Same thing with the test case, status against maybe person. There we go. Flip the order. There we go. All the graphs have data export. You can export the data as CSV, download it as a CSV. You can also export it as a graphic as well as these various built-in graphs and charts, which of course you can add to the dashboard using the add and remove items. You can also write custom graphs. These are some custom graphs I wrote that actually they come with the system because they're uh, in part of the sample data. That's why they're in the out of the box version. They're just some samples, but you can create custom graphs using our query language. And when you do that, those will appear. And to the end user, they're no different to a standard graph. Here it is. It's instanced by status. I can do a pie chart donut chart, I guess, a bar chart or line chart. And the great thing with the custom graphs is they are written by you. So if you go into the administration section, you can edit graphs and using our SQL language, our query language, you can build a graph just like that. And I did a webinar on Wednesday this week going through how you can actually do this. And we've got lots and lots of documentation on how you can build graphs, but it's really customizable. And you can do all your analytics directly in Spyro test. Same thing if you want to generate documentation. Let's say you want to create a requirements traceability matrix, or you want to join, join an Excel um, test plan or a Word task plan. All that can be exported out of the system really easily. There's a whole bunch of built-in uh, out-of-the-box reports, which I'm going to run now. Of course, you can use the edit re reports feature, just like the edit graphs, to create custom reports, which you can publish for your team as well. For the built-in graphs, all the custom graphs, you can filter them in different ways. In this case, I, I'm not going to bother filtering it because it's a relatively small project, but I could filter it by priority. I only want the requirements in a certain status or in a certain release or that have certain custom field values. And when you run that, you can then save that report configuration, make it a favorite. When the report runs, you can also save the finished report into our document repository where it could then be reviewed and, and analyzed as well and, and, and sent out for a review. I won't do that for time interest. I'm just going to run it immediately in the system. It's going to generate the report, open up as a PDF. And while that's running, let's go to Q&A. Are you able to see reporting how long a user story or test case? Um, yes, you can do that using a, a custom report with the history. There's also a custom built-in graphs um, for the, the uh, aging time. So we have some built-in graphs, and you can, or you can build a custom report if you want it in a spreadsheet as well. And let's have a look here. Uh, that's a standard traceability matrix. Here's the different uh, fields. Here you can see a requirements traceability where we've got requirements in one column, status, priority, type, and you can see the linked test cases, the linked requirements. If I scroll down, we've got the reverse traceability where you can see the test cases and the links back to the requirements. 
Uh, and that's one of the standard reports. All the other reports are available as well in the system. I mentioned like a test case, test plan. If you want to get a, a data on the test cases, just like an Excel sheet, you might want to run a test case summary report. And with the summary reports, you have Excel. I can run that without test steps. And I can just run that in a little bit of Excel. Give it a second. And that will be an Excel version of my spreadsheet with all my tests and things like date modified, last data, last integrated, last executed, and that's a list of all my test cases. Another useful report will be the release summary report that will show you every release in Sprint, number of tests run, number of tests passed, and so on. So there's lots of different reports you can run to get summary level information about the release, the Sprint, the test cases, requirements as well. There was a request to talk about Spira Capture. So let's quickly do that. And I think we've got three minutes left. Uh, any other q and I would write them now. Oh, one thing to mention is there is a full API on Spira test. So if you want to automate anything, you can go into Spira. Um, this API is common for Spira test team or plan. So it might say Spira team here. Uh, so the API is for the whole suite. Uh, for Spira test, you only obviously use the functions that are relevant for the testing requirements and defect tracking part of Spira. Things like task management and um, risk management. Those API calls would be available, but would, wouldn't be useful for you because you couldn't see the data. And you wouldn't have permissions to use them, but they are listed in the in the documentation. So while the documentation is coming up, um, let me uh, bring up Spira Capture. Spira Capture is a free tool. Here we go. Here's the API, and here's our REST API right here. So I want to create a new test case. I would use the test case endpoint, and I can go in here and I can just post new test cases. And we have documentation on all the fields you'd use, and we have some sample body representations using both JSON and XML. The JSON is pretty, pretty much more common these days. Um, Spira Capture is our free exploratory capture tool. If you go to our website, it's listed here. It's called Spira Capture, and it runs in the Chrome or Edge browsers. So let's go over here. I'm going to go back to my, my application I was testing. Let's pretend I'm testing this. I'm doing an exploratory session and I want to be able to, you know, log in and do stuff. But, you know, I, I don't have any formal test cases. But the problem is I hit a failure. And then the problem is I'm not going to remember what I did. Or worst case, I hit error and I won't remember what I did like three steps earlier. So this is really useful. What I do is I turn on Spira Capture. And I can say, uh, first I'll view the data from before and I want to clear out what I have. So clear everything. Yep. And now I'm going to start capturing. Yep. There we go. Good. It will automatically take screenshots every page change. You will automatically capture actions. You can also uh, add notes, a human entered. You can also split up your test into sections. Uh, just because we haven't got a lot of time, I'm going to do the very basics, which is not to do that. So I'll log in as librarian, log in as librarian. Just go away, go away. Uh, click around, let us create a book, Adam's book. That looks good. Create another book. Pretend. Oh, go to author management. Go back to home page. Log out. So I did some testing. Again, I would probably want to type notes as I'm doing it. But I didn't do that. And then if you go back to Spira Capture, you can then stop capturing and view my data. And then you've got an exploratory session. And now what you can do is review here. And let's say I want to send some of that to Spira as a defect. Now, I didn't really hit a bug, but pretend I hit a bug here. I might want to capture that screen. And uh, that screen, and maybe this only, but maybe these actions because they're useful in between. I can then send that to Spira and it will log it as a new defect. So, to do that, I go back to my Spira instance right here, go to Spira test, go back to my login, I need to create an API key. So, I'll do that really quickly. Hit that, hit save, grab my URL, go into here. Uh, grab my API key, boop, click on it, put it in the, in the clipboard, paste it in, username was administrator, which I don't recommend using in real life. You shouldn't use the admin user. That's okay for demos and webinars, but not for real use, please. Log into Spira. There we go. Send data to Spira. Oh, and it was me. I got to get the name of the defect. So, you know, bug when clicking around library information system. Uh, okay. Any other required fields? I don't think so. So send data, there we go. It's now creating my defect in Spira. And I'm not, I'm opening, I don't want to open it in Chrome because I'm actually logged into Firefox. So I'll copy the link and put it into my other browser. So I'm going to log in again. And 
there's my defect from Spira Capture. Lovely. Includes clicks on what I did, even includes the, the um, hierarchy. I see the heart, thank you. And there you go. Um, I've been using the export feature a lot. So question, um, I've been using the export feature a lot, but often as HTML PDF versions don't fully utilize the page width. Uh, there is a way to force it to use um, landscape. The other thing to do, because the, those are fixed width formats, whether it's landscape or portrait, what I would recommend for H for um, PDF would be to uh, clone the report and then just remove columns. So take the report, go into the edit report center, and clone the report, say climate traceability, <coughs> go into the clone, and then make a, make a version that has reduced columns, and then turn off the PDF export in the original, add it only into the, this version. And if you go in here, you can go in here. And we use XM, XHTML as the, the language for templating. If you go in here, you can see that there's additional columns. And let's say I want to remove the release column because it's unnecessary. You can remove the columns and then trim down the report that will fit onto a page. Because the problem is, unlike HTML, uh, PDF is a fixed width format and the text will only fit in a certain number of columns. Even with landscape, which you can switch it to, it's still only going to be limited. So you might want to go in and find for this particular report in this format, I really care about these things. So customize the template and then republish that as a different report name. All right. Um, it is now 11 o'clock Eastern and whatever time you're in, Thank you very much for joining today's demo. I hope this was helpful. I think we've answered all the questions that were raised. Uh, we are doing webinars on all of our products every month. And we'll be doing repeats, Spira Team and Spira Plan. In the Spira Team and Spira Plan ones, I'll be focusing more on the team unique features and the plan unique features, less of the testing. So um, feel free to come to those if you want to see some of the other functionality that I didn't show today. Uh, repeats, I'll be going through some different automation uh, challenges, web testing, desktop apps, and, and APIs. So hopefully see you at a future webinar. Otherwise, have a great Friday, great weekend. If it's already your afternoon, if it's your morning, I uh, hope you've had a good day at work and uh, see you soon. And thanks again.